Could one of the richest and most influential black women in media also be one of the most self-hating and problematic entities within the African-American community? Let's talk about it. Yo, what's up? I'm Jaded Nerd, and I wanted to do a video and discuss Oprah Winfrey. I wanted to talk about Oprah Winfrey because she's one of the people that you can instantly recognize. She has a rags to riches story, and she's generally well liked. I wanted to ask the question, could she be problematic to the community? Does she have issues of insecurity and self-loathing that extend from growing up and other things? I wanted to ask the question because I'm curious if these insecurities are there, if they're inherent, do they compromise her? And have they affected her ability to interact and treat people on her show differently? Well, I went back and I found an interview that she did on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace, December 14th, 1986. Now this is just before the national launch of her talk show, The Oprah Winfrey Show. It was getting national syndication. And she was discussing the critiques that she received 10 years prior when she got her first anchor job on a show called AM Chicago. So I want y'all to check this out and I'll come back with the rest of my commentary. I know now that I am where I am because I always believed I could get here. Always believed it. She may have believed it, but how did she get there? When she was 22, she moved to Baltimore and became an anchor woman on a local TV news show. This was 60 pounds ago. The you mean you were 60 pounds lighter? 60 pounds ago, I think of my life in terms of my thighs. Well, the new sister news director came to me and said, you know, your hair is too long, it's too thick, your eyes are too far apart, your nose is too wide, and your chin's too long, and you need to do something about it. I thought Christina Kraft had a problem. <laughs> so, but they sent me to this shishi poo poo salon, and in a week I was bald. Just devastated. devastated. You mean they, they did it to your hair? Yeah, I had a French perm and it all fell out. Every little strand, I was left with three little spriggles <laughs> in the front. Funny to you. They tried to change me, and then they're stuck with a bald, black anchor woman. I went through a real period of self-discovery because you have to find other reasons for appreciating yourself. It's certainly not your looks. So it's, for the first half hour, I want to talk about creative visualization because a lot of people don't know what the hell it is. Yeah. Well, today, 10 years later, her audience obviously has found her good to look at and to listen to. Do not, I hate that. No, Absolutely no, hate wait, it. Wait, wait, wait. I guess Isn't this a miracle? No. She arrives at the studio in Chicago each morning by seven o'clock. She insists she doesn't do much in the way of preparing for a daily show. She prefers to wing it, she says. Feels that if she talks about the things that interest her, the same things will interest the audience. So this show that just getting underway nationally. Mm -hmm. it, they, it's, it's going to do, it'll do well. And if it doesn't? And if it doesn't, I will still do well. I will do well because I'm not defined by a show. You know, I think we are defined by the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat other people. We can clearly see that those early critiques early on in her broadcasting career definitely affected her and they definitely were voices and it was part of that inner loop dialogue that we all have and it plays negative feedback and stuff like that. When she's speaking to Mike Wallace and when she is exuding this confidence, this hubris, I found it contrived at times. And a lot of times when people do have low self-esteem, they will project an exaggerated sense to compensate for how they truly feel. So you, you see her talking about how they talked about her looks, her aesthetic and things like that, and the extreme measures that she went through to get to that standard and how they damaged her even physically. You fast forward 10 years and you see how it's the Oprah Winfrey show and there's a conscious thought and there is an effort to maintain an aesthetic. Even with the confidence that she's showing in this interview, and I know I believe in myself and want to make it, you still see how those critiques about aesthetics were present and even her approach to the show. Which leads me to another question because if these insecurities are there, if this self-loathing is there, did it ever affect the way she treated people on her show? I have a video clip of Toni Braxton and she's describing her sit down with Oprah in 1988. Toni Braxton filed for bankruptcy and she did an appearance on the show and she and Oprah were talking. And I want you to pay attention to the line of questioning and the way that the interview goes and what Toni Braxton has to say about this. So I want y'all to check this out. Please welcome Toni Braxton. She was so freaking mean to me. 
I, I was in shock. Do you take responsibility for the situation that you're in right now? 100%. 100%. 100%. I couldn't believe it because I loved her so much. I admired her and looked up to her. And she pretty much reprimanded me. I read that you were upset about stories that your overspending caused this. She says to me, I hear you have Gucci flatware. I'm Oprah Winfrey and I don't have Gucci flatware. First of all, I didn't know Gucci made silverware. You ain't got Gucci flatware because you didn't want to buy it. It's not because you couldn't afford it. What do you mean? And immediately, she made me feel this big, this big. That moment completely changed my career. It made people look down on me. You know, a lot of times when they do these shows, they give a basic rundown of this is what we'll talk about. The interview will go kind of like this. Just a basic guideline of questions and things like that. So they're not totally caught off guard. There's always the chance to be spontaneous and something can, you know, they can slip something in, but you pretty much have a pretty good sense of what you're going to discuss. Watching that clip, you could see on Toni Braxton's face like, she felt bad. You can see that she was mortified by, by the, the energy and, and the aggressiveness that, that Oprah Winfrey was kind of bringing to her and it was kind of scolding her and, and kind of shaming her. And you would think that for someone like Oprah who had a rags to riches story and to see someone, a black woman that had a rags to riches story in a sense and then to lose the money even if it is through bad decision making or you know financial illiteracy at the time or not knowing how to manage the money but it wasn't criminal and as tony stated she kind of looked at her like a mentor everyone looked up to oprah and if you could scold it in that way publicly i think definitely left a lasting impression upon her and i want you to remember that because i want you all to check out this clip and this is early on in her show and she actually invites on you know skinheads in the hopes of having a productive discussion and conversation about racism and intolerance and, and, and how we can find middle ground. But I want y'all to check it out, see what happened, see the result of that, and then I'll come back with the rest of my commentary. My guests today call themselves skinheads. They say their heads are shaved for battle. Do you believe that only white people created this country? Everything's created around here is created by white people, you know, all the music writers and, you know, Builders, great architects who are white, you know, blacks, they still live in the jungles of Africa, you know, like over here, white people teach these people, you know, they, they didn't create anything over here, they just followed us, you know, we taught them. Mike, why is violence necessary? Violence, violence is necessary when it's brought to us. And we've had people come at us with bats, knives, and stuff like that. Oprah says she and her producers believed they would be exposing ignorance and confronting hate, but they were wrong. The men came with their own agenda, and in the end, a panel of racists were given an hour-long platform to spread their message of evil. I just heard what you said. You just said, I don't sit with monkeys. You think because she's black, because I'm black, we're, we're, we're monkeys? Is that... That's a proven fact. That's a proven fact? <laughs> it's a proven fact that I'm a monkey? Could be. No, <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. First thing I want to get off my mind is... Hell. I want to talk about this monkey you stuff. Know, these skin is... You know, <laughs> Okay. No, no, no. I want to talk about the monkey business. I want to talk about... <laughs> Support black. Sit down. Sit down. I'll take a break. I'll be right back. Uh, well, I just want to tell you what happened during the commercial break. We asked... Uh, we asked our friend Mr. Monkey Comment over here to leave. And uh, some other people followed him. I, I have to agree with this woman down here who said, I have never seen such or felt such evilness and such hatred in all of my life. That was the show that changed the way Oprah thought about TV and how it should be used for good. I bring this clip to y'all because I wanted you to observe a couple of things and we'll break it down. One of the first things that jumps out is she lets you know I'm not afraid of controversy. So if there's something that is controversial or something that's going to get people talking or drive the discussion, that's where I am. But there were other aspects of this interaction with the skinheads that I want to point out. They were completely and utterly rude and dismissive and disrespectful to Oprah, the platform, and any people of color or any minority that could have been in attendance watching or anything. Even getting to a point of him moving her hand away. 
You get what I'm saying? And all but calling her a monkey. It gets so volatile that they end up leaving the show and then she vows to never do another show like that. I want y'all to check out the next part of this clip because in her farewell season, two of those men return. And I want y'all to notice the difference in how she talks to these two men versus how she talked to Tony Braxton. Tony Braxton declared bankruptcy. These two men were outright racists and had to leave the show because how volatile the situation became. That was a pivotal moment in Oprah's show history. But in that final season, that show served as a measure for how far people can come. Dave Mazzella and Mike Barrett were two of the white supremacists who were on that show and they wanted to be here today. And I said, okay to that because I hear you change. Yeah, first and foremost, I just, I'd like to express, you know, absolutely from the bottom of my heart, I apologize for how we were on your show because we were rude, we were arrogant, we were disruptive mm -hmm. and hateful. And I just, I apologize first and foremost to you just for the evil that we Apology accepted. And Mike, where were you in your life at that time? What do you think when you see yourself on that tape? It really brings tears to my eyes. Really? Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. That kid was lost. Oh. And, uh, you were lost. Yeah. Well, one year after that show, uh, Mike went to prison for defacing a synagogue. Uh, Dave went to jail for assault. And Mike says, you had an epiphany in prison? What happened? I did. Um, the crew they put me on was entirely black, uh -huh. including the black sergeant. So here I am, the only white guy. I but bet I, you uh, weren't waving that white supremacist flag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, what, the epiphany what happened? was, you know, it was... Um, <clears throat> These guys accepted me for who I was. Mm -hmm. They already knew about my past because it was tattooed all over my back and my neck. I had swastikas all over me and stuff like that. Wow. But they treated me like a human being. Mm. And it just taught me that everybody's a human being. Mm -hmm. And we can't just hate people. What made you change, Dave? Well, about six months after the show, um, I ended up recruiting a group up in Portland, Oregon that ended up murdering an Ethiopian student. Wow. And uh, at that point, that woke me up. And uh, I realize that there's consequences to ideas. Do you feel better as a human being now? Almost oh, definitely. Um, I feel differently. I'm, I'm so embarrassed when I, you know, obviously watch things like that. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing being here today because of my past. I, I don't like it. Um, and it's humiliating. The way that she scolded Tony Braxton about this and asking these questions, but never really offering any kind of constructive help or any kind of nurturing assistance or saying, hey, I, you know, anything I can do to help or, you know, any resources that we can really, you know, refer you to, to get you onto the path of financial literacy so you manage your money better in the future. I don't even know if that was offered, but the sympathy, empathy, and gentle nature that she extended to these two men that disrespected her and basically admitted that they were hateful. So for her to be so rude and so mean to Tony Braxton about bankruptcy, but then you have these two guys return and and, 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 and and even one guy admitted that his actions led to the death of a minority. Was it that she's gonna inherently be more aggressive and, and, and more detached to her own versus a white counterpart that could truly do something egregious, but she tends to extend all of the sympathy, all of the, the understanding, all of those things that she was never allotted, she, she gives to them, but not her own. There are examples that the way people saw her aesthetics, the fact that she was a black woman and she was ridiculed for her features and she had to alter herself to make herself more palatable. It has always been with her and it drives a lot of how she thinks and what she does and how she feels. Check out this clip of her and Barbara Walters and Barbara Walters asks her a very provocative question. Check it out and then I'll come right back with the rest of my commentary. Did you ever wish you were white? Mm. Yeah, I did. I was growing up in Mississippi, and it's the kind of thing that I hesitate to say because when you say it, all the black groups call you and say, how dare you say it? But yes, I did. And I did now, I understand, not because, you know, white is better, but mm -hmm. because in my mind then, white kids were loved more, they received more, their parents were nicer to them. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted that kind of life. I wanted to be one of the Kool-Aid kids. And uh, it's, you know what changed it for me? The night I saw Dinah Ross and the Supremes on the Ed Sullivan Show, I thought, I want to be like that. And so, uh, 
you know, I look back on my life and I think when I, when you ask me about how did I get to be here, there's so many little pieces to mm -hmm. the process that has helped me to, to be who I am. It's, it's something as small as seeing Diana Ross in the Supremes. I remember the night I was 10 years old and Sidney Poitier received the Academy Award for Lilies of the Field. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna be there. And it's the first time, you know, it makes me wanna cry because it's the first time I thought I can do that. And uh, so the night I was at the Academy Awards, I just, I thought I did this. But why the tears now? Well, because I think that uh, it's the first time I've really thought about all the things that I really wanted. I have them. And uh, tell me what they were. I wanted, I wanted, uh, I wanted to be somebody. And I think perhaps maybe I've been so busy just being that person that um, this is one of the first times I thought, yes, I, yes, I have done that. I have done that. To have gotten there and know that you worked to get there. And that it wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy. It feels very good. When Oprah answered that question, and then when she said it wasn't about white being better, she basically said, look, it's the love and support that they get from their families. And that's what I wanted. So again, you know about her upbringing and, and, and the tension between her and her father and things like that. And, and, and we know her story and how she got to where she is. And then you couple that with the critiques and the criticisms about her looks, about her features, about being a black woman. And then you can start seeing how, OK, if you have someone that went through that, was ridiculed for her features, has expressed that at one time in her life, I wanted to be a white woman. And then when she does talk about seeing Diana Ross and on TV and it changed her perspective, think about this. Diana Ross and the Supremes were, were trained in etiquette. There was a conscious decision and there was an entire program at Motown that taught the artists how to talk walk and sing in a way that would make them more crossover so that the white audiences would accept them and buy the music. So she was looking at a projected version of what was acceptable in terms of being black. That's what she was identifying with. There's a point in Oprah's career early on in her show where she actually achieves what I believe to be the pinnacle of what she wanted versus the critiques that she received when she first got into the business. When Oprah Winfrey lost her first significant amount of weight in 1988, I believe she lost 67 pounds, it was shocking because up until that point, everyone had seen her one way. There's a place here called Moo and Oink. Moo, 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 moo and Oink. And uh, uh, I say, let's go over to Moo and Oink and uh, see if we can get uh, 67, see what 67 pounds of uh, mooing oink fat looks like and let's put it in a wagon that's why I did it at the time I felt it was important to show it in that way because I had not I'd starved I'd literally starved for four months or four and a half months and thought well everybody's going to want to know how you lost the weight so you might as well tell them a lot of you already know that what I did was what I did was I fasted for without cheating for a solid six weeks. And uh, Mary Kay, who's a member, producer on the staff here, got married. And I said to them when I first started this liquid protein supervised, medically supervised fast, I said to them when I went in with the counselor that six weeks into this, I know I'm going to eat something because I'm giving the wind and I'm paying for the food, so I intend to eat it. And so I did, I cheated but it was controlled cheating halfway into the diet. But up until six weeks, I ate absolutely nothing. I want you to know that whatever diet you choose, and this audience is filled with people who've had great successes, you can do with the help of your family doctor. And if you can believe in yourself and believe that this is the most important thing in your life, as, as Scott said to us earlier, you can conquer it. Because if I did it, 
If Scott did it, if Billy did it, you can do it. I thank you very much. Everything about that day, that show, and that display was her way of saying, I got you and look at what I've done, look at me now. Pulling out the wagon to show the visual representation of the weight. The way that she described the extreme nature in which she was willing to go to achieve this goal. You get what I'm saying? The, the, the fact that she wore the clothes that she wore to show it off so you can truly see I'm not the woman that I used to be. You're asking, why is this important? Why does this matter? Why are you making these connections? This is why. Over the years, she's been very direct and aggressive with the way that she investigates, interviews, and questions black men and black women. You have situations where she's befriended people like Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein. And you would begin to ask the question that with a track record like Oprah Winfrey, where she was never afraid of controversy and speaking her mind and being authentic and letting people connect with that. Why wouldn't she want to question an interview and seek justice and truth in these situations with her white counterparts when she's done it to people within her own community? Even to the point where people said she's been tone deaf. It makes me question her ability to be unbiased to her own community, especially when she chooses to interview people or participate in documentaries as they involve black men and black women versus her white counterparts. And they are dealing with issues that are just as salacious, if not more so. You wonder and you ask, why hasn't she said anything? Why hasn't she asked them anything? Where is that, that thirst for knowledge and wanting to get to the truth? Because she seems to, 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 to hold a higher standard to those within her own community, but she doesn't extend that to those that are her white counterparts. But what do you think? How do you see Oprah? Has any of the information that you've seen and any of the video that you've watched, has it given you a different perspective? Do you still feel the same way? Or perhaps are you questioning whether or not insecurity is something that she still deals with to this day? I wanna say thank you for checking out the video. It really means a lot to me. If you can, please throw a like on the video, subscribe and share. It's greatly appreciated. I'm Jaded Nerd. I'll talk to y'all next time.